you are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 87. In a vast majority of stories, a character with weaknesses struggles to achieve something and ends up changed positively or negatively as a result. John Truby. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Now, guys, today on the show, we have one of the most popular guests that has ever graced the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. The legendary John Truby is back. John is the author of The Anatomy of Story, 22 Steps to Becoming a Master Storyteller, and he was episode number one of this podcast and has been downloaded tens of thousands of times, if not over a 100,000 times. John is one of the most respected and sought-after story consultants in the film industry. He has had over 50,000 students over the course of his career, and his former students have earned more than $15 billion at the box office with films like Ratatouille, Pirates of the Caribbean, Marvel's X-Men Saga, Shrek, Breaking Bad, Planet of the Apes, Scream, The Fantastic Four, Star Wars, and so many more. John has a very unique way of looking at story and breaking story down in a way that everybody can understand. And this is also one of the reasons why I teamed up with John to create a free webinar for the tribe, and it's called Stories That Sell. If you want to watch this over hour-long webinar, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash Truby. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my epic conversation with John Truby. I'd like to welcome back to the show, returning champion, John Truby. How are you doing, John? <laughs> Good to see you, Alex. Great to be back. You, um, you were one of, uh, you were actually episode one of the Bulletproof Screenwriting uh, podcast uh, a while ago when I first launched this podcast, and and it's been one of the most downloaded episodes uh, in the history of the show, and it was fairly epic, if I remember. It was like nine, yeah. at least ninety minutes. So yeah, you everyone. Went off. Everyone listening, strap in because it's going to be a, it's going to be a wild ride. Now, um, for people who don't know who you are, John, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I've been teaching story for over thirty years now. Um, most of the students that I've had, I've had over fifty thousand students uh, are screenwriters, but my work has been focused toward story in general, meaning it works for novelists, screenwriters, short story, theater, video game. Every medium there is, is all about telling a great story. And even though there are clearly some major differences between the mediums, I've found that if you know the techniques of good storytelling, uh, you will be successful in any one of those mediums. So I've been really doing that and, and also uh, for the last over 30 years uh, working as a story consultant, script consultant. And that's where most of my work has been done. I've done over a thousand scripts. Um, and it, it's, you know, what happens is typically a studio will come to me with a script that needs work. 
Obviously, they don't want to spend upwards of 100 to $200 million making and, and marketing it without having a script that's going to be that's going to work. Mm-hmm. And so they asked me, you know, and then I'm coming in not as a co-writer, not as a, somebody who is writing dialogue, but somebody who is going to help them get the story right. And then and, and what a lot of people don't realize is that most scripts that are actually made um, have other writers, story consultants, that sort of thing come on board uh, because it's just too expensive not to get it right. So that's that's what I've been spending my time doing. And uh, I found that that trying to understand story is a lifetime commitment. It's, <laughs> it, it's that fascinating and it's that complex. And what I've tried to do is 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 turn probably the most complex craft in the world into something that's easy to understand and easy to apply so that a writer can write their own best work. That's that's really what I'm always about is is helping writers write their best. What I what I find fascinating uh, from our last interview and from your book, by the way, which everybody listening, if you have not read Anatomy of Story, um, you're doing yourself a disservice. So you have to read this book. Um, it's been out for a while, but boy, does it, it, it that is as evergreen of a book as I've ever seen one. <laughs> um, it, it'll be it'll still be fresh in a hundred years. It'll still be fresh because story is story, no matter. It's it going back to poetics. <laughs> yep, that's right. So, but what I what one thing that kind of blew my mind when I spoke to you the first time, and I just never thought of it this way. It was like, you know, you always think of the three act structure. You always think of the you know the beginning, the middle, the end, the hero's journey, all of those kind of things. You know, and 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 Campbell and and that kind of stuff. And you said something that was so. So it kind of rocked my world and story. You're like, well, why don't you throw the hero's journey and a detective story? Let me see how that works out for you. Yeah. And I was just, I just, my mind exploded because it was like, it just blew the doors off the concept that every single story is exactly the same, which it's not. So can you kind of delve a little bit into that? Yeah. It, it what you put your finger on is, in my opinion, the biggest problem that writers face. Screenwriters fail. They have these these two basic models for how they think you're supposed to write this script and tell this story. One is hero's journey, the other is three x structure. And the problem is that they're highly limited. They're basically for elementary level writing. They're they're for beginners. And they simply don't work at the professional level. The reason they don't work at the professional level is different depending on which ones you're going to use. When it comes to Hero's Journey, the problem with Hero's Journey is that the beats that are listed there, those are the Joseph Campbell beats, those are valid beats. Mm -hmm. But those are the beats of a myth story. Myth is one of the major genres. Uh, I do classes in all the major genres. Myth is one of them, but there's another 12 or 13 major genres that all worldwide storytelling is based on. Either one of those genres or more more typically a mix, a combination of those. Well, Campbell laid out very effectively the beats of the myth form, which is probably the oldest story form. The problem is in, in, in the modern day, we're not just writing myth stories. Uh, and, and specifically, another criticism of the Joseph Campbell Beats is that they're actually not just a myth story. They are the male warrior myth story. For example, they don't have anything to do with the female myth, which is a massive story form in the myth area. So the problem is, that's why I mentioned before, you know, if you're going to write a detective story, which is a relatively modern form, you're going to be in big trouble. You're going to write yourself into a hole really fast. Uh, love story, crime story, um, fantasy. Fantasy has certain connections to myths, so you won't be as big a trouble if you do it with fantasy. But even there, the story structure of myth and fantasy are fundamentally different. They are different beasts. And so if you're using a structure for myth to write a fantasy, it's going to take you down the wrong track. Now, when it comes to three-act structure, 
that's an even bigger problem. Because three-act structure, it, at least with, with Hero's Journey, those beats are valid. Those actually will tell a good story in the myth theory. But three-act structure is, is nothing. There's nothing in it. It's simply a way to break a story into three sections because it appears to make it more manageable. But really all it does is give you guideposts when you say, I'm in the first act. Well, you're in the beginning. And if I'm in the second act, I'm in the middle. You know, all it is is fancy words apply to beginning, middle, and end. And what I'm, I've always contended is it doesn't do anything for you in terms of creating a story. Three Act was really invented by a story analyst looking at a script after it had been written to try to see if he could figure out what was happening at each step of the process. Reverse engineering, step. reverse engineering. Exactly. exactly. And – and unfortunately, in my opinion, this caught on and it became kind of the, you know, the, the mantra that people would use. And I believe that it has caused more problems. It has killed more writers, writing careers than any other single element in story. And that's why that's why I've been so, you know, adamant about over the over 30 years that I've been teaching story that it's fine to start with it. That's great because when you're first starting, you don't know what you're doing. It, it gives you a little confidence. It gives you a sense of, well, let's, let's, I, I can at least divide this. The, these events are going to happen in the first act and this will ha- generally happen in the second act and this will happen in the third act. Well, that's helpful. But what the, I always th- then say is now you got to move beyond that because the, the professional storytelling, especially in screenwriting, is so much more advanced than that, that if you're relying on that and, and you think that you have now learned how to structure a story, you're dead. You're absolutely dead. There, there is, there is a, I've, I've had the, uh, the privilege of interviewing a lot of big time you know, very successful screenwriters on the show. And I've talked to them uh, sometimes on air, sometimes off. But from what I hear, like I I, I love talking about the hero's journey and all this kind of stuff with them sometimes. And they say a a couple of these, you know, these are billion dollar, I call them billion dollar (laughs) screenwriters because they've worked on some very big shows. And they go, look, man, you can, after the fact, you can slap anything onto a story. So our structure is concerned. I can make it look like a hero's journey. I can throw five acts on it. I can throw four acts on it. I can throw six acts on it. I can, it's just kind of like you're trying to just, it's not what started the process, but you can slap whatever shell you want on it after the fact. And the problem is that a lot of screenwriters think that that is the only way. And like you're saying early on, it makes a lot of sense, but when you start getting into some more advanced storytelling, more advanced screenwriting, um, you're, it's not just the, the simple three-act structure, even though you can apply that onto it. Yeah. Like you, you can well, apply- what, I, what I always tell people is that is, you know, they, they say, well, well, John, you know, I applied it to my script or I applied it to Raiders of the Lost Ark or this movie or that movie, and it was, it, it was there. Mm-hmm. And I, I say exactly what you just said, which is you can divide anything into three parts right. or four parts or seven parts or ten parts. You know, it's you're taking a pie and you're just making more slices. That doesn't mean that it's going to give you any techniques or tools to create the pie in the first place. And that's the big distinction that people have so much trouble with. And so hard to get them to go beyond that in order to really become a craftsperson at the highest level. And that, that's, again, what we're all, all talking about. We, 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 what we should be talking about is how do you write at the level that can get you professional work? And that means you got to be really, really good at all of these skills of story, including character, structure, plot, theme, symbol, and so on and so forth, that three act doesn't even touch. It, it's 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 fascinating because, you know, I, I love the pie technique because it's like it's literally a pie, and you, I can look at the pie and I can say what the pie was made of, but I I didn't bake the pie. <laughs> you need to know how the baker did what the baker does. 
um, which is which is remarkable. Um, so going going back a little bit, when you're seeing screenwriters, is, is that the biggest mistake you see screenwriters make? Is 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 applying this this three act structure? Because like you said, Raiders of the Lost Ark. To my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the Raiders of the Lost Ark is a five act show, or is it, or is it not? Because you could cut up, you could cut it up into three. That's my point. It's yeah. it's totally arbitrary. You are you're adding an outside division to the process. What I talk about in the anatomy of the story is a story process that is organic, which simply means I'm going to track a main character working through a plot to get a goal. And therefore, what what is actually sequencing that story is the development of that character as they go from first wanting the goal to either accomplishing it or failing to get the goal. And what is the internal change that that person goes through as they go through the process, the external process of a plot? And that that means that every story that you write is going to be unique because it's going to be based on you, your unique main character and nobody else has that character. And how you take that character, how you make them change. And so that's whereas with with React, we've just taken any old story and said, okay, we're going to divide it at this point and at this point. And now we've got three acts. Has nothing to do with the main character. It has nothing to do with the more complex plot sequence. Now, to get to your question, this problem with three act, it, it is the biggest problem that people have only because it prevents them from understanding how to solve the real problem. And the real problem that, and, and I base this on years of experience and thousands of writers. The real problem that writers have in terms of working professionally is they don't know how to construct a plot. Plot is the game because we're talking about popular storytelling and what drives popular storytelling in every medium, including screenwriting, is the ability to come up with a surprising plot that people have not seen before. Now, think about how hard that is, especially when you have people doing things like Hero's Journey and so on, which are hitting the same beats every single time. How are you going to come up with something that they haven't seen before? In fact, that's the biggest problem other with three act, excuse me, with um, Hero's Journey. I mentioned that it only applies to myth, but the other problem is that we've seen it so many times that everybody knows what's going to happen. It's boring. Right. right. So it, it, it comes down to this, this problem of plot. And, and, and why do I say it? Anybody who's been writing for any length of time knows the importance of a strong main character. Okay? So they, they study, they work hard to try to come up with and understand how, how you create a good main character. They know the importance of good dialogue. Okay? Which you do at the end of the process. And where they run into the problem is that when they think about, okay, now it comes time for me to create the plot. Well, they don't know how to do that. And there's no book that tells them, they think, that tells them how to do that. And so they think, well, I'll just figure it out as I go. And guess what? (laughs) It doesn't work that way. You are not going to figure it out as you go. What is going to happen 99% of the time is that you – Start down this path of the plot. You're going to get about 15 or 20 pages in. You're going to run yourself into a dead end, and you're going to stop. You're going to run into writer's block. And you're going to think, well, this is some kind of psychological problem. No, it's not a problem of psychology. It's a problem of your plot. You don't know what the story is going to do here. And because you didn't think of it from the beginning as an entire plot sequence, you're not going to be able to get out of this problem. And so what I'm what I've been really pushing the last few years, um, all of the work, the new work that I've been doing is all about how do you create plot? How do you explain to people how to create plot? Because it's very complicated. And especially how do you create plot that gives your story maximum narrative drive? Because that's what the studio studios want. Studios care about three things. Three things when they get your script. Narrative drive, 
narrative drive, and narrative drive. That's it, because that's what sells to a worldwide audience. Right. And that's something like Raiders of the Lost Ark. What does it have? It has fantastic narrative drive. It also has a great character. It has some fun scenes, some fun dialogue. There's some great fantasy in there and so on and so forth. But what's really making that thing work? It's fantastic narrative drive. That is the definition of popular storytelling. And so that's where I've been doing all my work and trying to get writers to focus on to understand if you want to succeed at the highest levels, you've got to become a master of plot. You'll get the character. You'll get the dialogue. If you write a good plot with a strong main character, the dialogue practically writes itself. People don't think I'm crazy when I say that, but it's absolutely true because then you're not asking the dialogue to do what it can't do. You're not asking the dialogue to structure the story, which a lot of people do. Right. So that's why that's why it, um, I push so hard on this um, on creating plot, learning how to create plot, especially plot with intense narrative drive. And that that's by the way, you know, the, we're going to talk later about the story rescue worksheet that I have for people. That's what that's all about too. It's just, these are techniques to give you maximum narrative drive in your script. Now, I, I was reading a book, uh, the Stephen King book on writing, which is a fantastic book. And he, he said something and always stuck with me was really, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on this, is that he's like, if you, you have to have the basics of grasp of the English language. So he goes, you have to understand this, this, and this, and it has to be instinctual, not because like when I'm writing, um, because I've been writing for, you know, you know, a long time as throughout my life, just as not even in creative, just generally, you have a, a, a kind of taste for what English is supposed to sound like and how mm -hmm. it's supposed to be written and basic grammar. And these, these are things he goes, you need to understand this instinctually. If you're thinking about it too heavily, you need to go back to the drawing board. And I feel that with master storytellers, a lot of this is just instinctual because they've done it so many times. Like a master craftsman, like a master carpenter, like a master painter, there's certain strokes that they've done 10,000 times. Yes. And if you try to, um, to verbalize it, it's almost impossible to verbalize because it, 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 I find that is almost always the case with really the top writers. They're very bad at verbalizing how they got there. Right. What, what I would say to a Stephen King or anyone else like that is, yeah, you're absolutely right. Once you get to that position where you're writing at that level, sure. you know, yeah, you, you, but, but that's, you, you don't need to analyze it too much because you've already got it as part of your second and third nature. It's mm -hmm. already embedded in how you think. What they never talk about is, well, gee, Stephen, how did you – did you have this kind of ability when you were six years old and first going to school? No, you didn't. You know, it's by the, by the time you've gotten through all your education and you've written all these books and you've made some mistakes and you obviously have, have done extremely well at the same time, that entire process is a process of – of improving and increasing the craft. Now, he may not be one who likes to verbalize it or analyze it. That's great. That's mm -hmm. fine. But what I would say to anybody else who is not currently writing at the level of Stephen King. Which is not many, by the way. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you don't have that luxury. Right. right. You do not have that luxury. And that's why when, you know, in the anatomy story book, and the, the recent work I've been doing on plot, it's all about trying to give people techniques, specific applicable techniques that you can apply to your story right now. And in doing that, you're going to master that technique so that down the road a few years, when your level of ability has gone way up, then you don't have to think, what was the, what was the name of that technique? That I it's no, there. I it's in there. Use. Exactly. But it's the same thing as, uh, you know, and I, if I hate to use baseball analogies, but I absolutely love using baseball analogies where you, know, you might have a natural swing. And maybe when you're, you know, 15, 16, 17, you, you have a natural swing. But when you start getting, you know, that that natural swing is not going to get you 
into the majors for you to be anybody of any magnitude. Yeah. So slowly but surely, as you take more swings, you start getting coached. You start, you know, you start getting coached on technique here. Now you pick up a thing there or there. And then because you've been at the plate so many times, it becomes second nature. You don't even think about it. You don't analyze it. But as you're going up, you're analyzing that swing. You're watching sure. it. You're str- you're sure. really taking notice. But at a certain point, you're getting, and you're getting feedback from that batting coach who right. is saying, "Hey, I noticed there's a little switch in your swing that you didn't have two weeks ago. Right? And you haven't been hitting since then. And because you need that outside eye to say, look, that natural process, quote, natural process." which is actually made up of multiple smaller techniques, somehow it got out of kilter. And we got to identify that and fix it so you can get back to the natural swing. So you're ba- so basically like a story chiropractor. chiropractor. <laughs> you got <Okay>. ch- <laughs> to adjust the spine to get gotta it get that, back. Get that spine, that structure working. But I, I use a similar, I use a similar uh, analogy with, with basketball. I mean, if 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 I wasn't writing and and teaching writing, uh, I would like to be a point guard in the NBA. That that would be my second choice. Sure. Um, sure. Now, and you know, and, and I always, and and this comes up when when people say to me, you know, John, um, I I don't need to read any of these books. All I need to do is write. You know. All you have to do to write successfully is to write. Well, there's a certain truth to that, right? If you don't write anything, you're not going to write successfully because you haven't written anything. But to think that all you have to do is write in order to write at the professional level is nonsense. It's a similar thing of saying, you know, I would like to play point guard in the NBA, all I have to do is play, play a lot basketball. of basketball, right? <laughs> now, that's going to take me a lot of time on, on the playground, right? I'm going to sure. get a lot of time playing basketball. But I'm not going to get close to the NBA because, A, I don't have the natural ability. But much more importantly, I have not been getting ex- extensive, high-level coaching since the age I picked up the ball. Right. You know, you, you take a guy like a Michael Jordan or or – for for younger people than myself, LeBron, LeBron James, James, right? Right. The the guy is a fantastic natural talent, sure. But the guy has been getting coaching to refine that talent for his entire life and practicing and and, and adjusting practicing. and going. And in. what happens is we look at him at when he plays, just as we look at a a Stephen King book, and we see the polished product. We don't see the techniques, the hundreds of techniques sitting under the surface that makes it look like he's just taking a walk in the park. Right. It's a lot more complicated than that. And to get to that level or to attempt to get to that level, you got to learn those techniques. Right. And it's the same thing with like film directing. Like, you know, you look at the masters and you just go, oh my God, like you look at a Kubrick film. And there's just so much density in his technique. And he literally would wait five, seven years prepping a film. So he had everything really – or Hitchcock or these kind of guys. Um, but there is so much work that goes into that that makes it, it – the easier it looks, the harder it was to get there. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> many, many, many ways. Absolutely. Now, you, I'm sure you're asked by screenwriters, you, you're asked questions all the time uh, from screenwriters, uh, how do we get better, how to do this. What are th- some of the best questions you get asked by screenwriters? Well, uh, let me first start off by saying the wrong questions. I was yeah. going to, that was my next question, but, now you, but you, you ruined it, John, but go ahead. <laughs> Oh, we'll start off with the worst, then we'll go to the yeah. best. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, the worst is see, it, it, it's there's a, it has to do with the underlying problem. Most writers think that the reason they have not yet reached success is because they don't know the right people. This is a business of connections. How many times have we heard that? Mm-hmm. And so when I would give a talk or teach a class, the, the, the inevitable question is, um, how do I sell my script? How do I get an agent? How do I meet producers who will buy my material and so on? In other words, it's not about how do I write better. 
It's how do I sell? And clearly, these are concerns. We, we want to sell our work. But I consider that the by far the biggest misconception that writers have about why they do not succeed. And I believe that in order to succeed, you've got to know what the problem is first. The problem is not that you're not connected. I find that 99.9% of writers, when they finally meet a connection who could really do them some good, mm-hmm. they don't have the material to give to them. Not right. And but by, by the material, I mean, I don't mean they don't have a script. They got a script. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. But they don't want to say that to me. They don't want to say, hey, John, you know, I don't think I'm a good enough writer yet. Um, and I don't want to say it to them. But that's the that's the probable fact is what you need to be knowing, what you what you need to be asking is technically what is wrong with my story? Why is this story not working? Because the only thing that sells is story. So, you know, when it when it comes time to the best question, it really it tends to be focused on. Does if the writer understands that the real structural elements under the surface that are making all the difference and do what some of those are, that they understand the desire line. And so they'll ask me, is my desire line working? Because the desire is the spine of the story. If, if they ask me a question like that, I know this person has a shot to write a really good script because everything's going to hang on that spine. And then if they ask me something like the conflict is not working, I don't know why, that tells me also that they're on the right track because after desire and spine is opposition and conflict. You can't figure out the opposition until you get the goal. This is a big mistake that a lot of writers make. You know, they they think they might think in terms of conflict first, and there's no goal to hang it on. There's nothing to fight about. You can't have people fight unless they're fighting over a goal. And that is a goal that both the hero and the main opponent should have. So when I hear people talk about these, these structural underpinnings of a good story, then I know that they're focused in the right area and they may not fix the problem right now, but they're going to get it because if you stay focused on those kind of structural things, I always say, if you get the seven steps right, it's really hard to screw it up. And by the seven steps, I'm going to put the seven major structure steps in any good story. You get those right. You've got the DNA of the story. You've got the basic fabric and 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 structure spine of that story and then the rest of it is adding on the special details the twists and turns and so on but if you've got the strong spine if, and if your opposition set up and conflict is correct it's it's going to make that part of it so much easier now everyone's always looking at blockbusters and how to write this, you know, how to make money with their scripts and all this stuff. And, and what makes a blockbuster a blockbuster? So I'll ask you the question, what are some key elements to a successful popular film? Even right. though both you and I know, and I'll speak for you and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the <laughs> chances of a screenwriter who's starting out writing a 150 to $200 million script that gets picked up by a studio is Zero point zero 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 percent, but but I think that even if if they're able to write something of that magnitude, it might be a good right example, or might get them an agent, or might get them, and God knows, it might get produced or picked up or something. Yeah. But what are those key elements? And do you agree with that? And what are the key elements? I do agree with that. Um, the your idea when you're writing that script is not to sell. It, it's highly unlikely that it's going to happen. If it happens, fantastic. But what you're trying to do is show that you're a professional, right. that, that, that you are at the level that you can be hired because that's where all the work is not in spec scripts. It's, it's getting hired because, because you're a professional and you, they know you're going to do the job and, and, and think about it. You, you got, you got all this money that you have to spend on a writer. You're going to want to be damn certain that this person is going to produce in this very esoteric world of writing and uh, creating a new story that they're going to be able to come in with a great, a, a great script every time 
including the time when they spit when I give them my money. So absolutely, that's correct. The it's funny that you ask this question because I always ask question to students when I teach my anatomy of story class. I say, why do you think? What do you think is causes a blockbuster? Why is there a blockbuster? And and I usually do it in terms of you know American movies by far make the most money in the world. Mm-hmm. So I always do it in terms of I'm, maybe I'm teaching Berlin or in Paris or whatever. Say so why do American movies make so much money? And they always have the same two answers, and it's and it's hilarious. The first answer they give is you have all the movie stars, and <laughs> okay. and I say, I say okay yes true, but. Hollywood has not been a movie star based business for at least 20 years, right, at right. least 20 years. Um, and the only people who don't know that still may be a few movie stars left that are not getting paid what they think they deserve. But 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 other than that, you know, it's not a movie star business. The other the, the, then they give the answer. Well, you spend all this money on special effects. Right. And we, and we do, yes, we do. All those, all those Marvel movies, they spend a lot of money on special effects. But, That's but then I point out there's just hundreds, thousands of movies that spent a lot of money on special effects and they were bombs at the box office. And movie stars. And movie stars. Absolutely. <laughs> so neither of those has to do is, or they're way down the list in terms of why is something a blockbuster. And, the answer, and it won't be surprising hearing it from me, but it, it is true. I fervently believe it. The reason that a movie is a blockbuster is embedded right in the script. And it has to do with those key structural elements I was just talking about. The first of it, first of them being a desire line, a strong, clear desire line that extends through the entire length of the script that the hero chases after with intense speed and energy and will do anything to get it because what that does is it provides narrative drive which does not depend on particular culture everybody knows i see a character with a goal i like the character i want him to get the goal therefore if i can see him blast through all these opponents trying to stop him, especially if he is starts off as an underdog Mm -hmm. and then gets the goal. Fantastic. World over. No matter what the language, no matter what the culture, they want to see that. So that's what you start off with. You start off with this strong spine. And, and, and And I talk about this in the story rescue worksheet, which is it's gotta be a goal with a clear endpoint. We have to know specifically at the end of the story, did the hero get it or fail? Now, obviously, most of the time they get it. And usually if you want a blockbuster, it's a good idea for them to succeed in the goal. But interestingly enough, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that he has that goal and then he goes after it with intense speed and energy that makes all the difference. I mean, Raiders, Raiders, he didn't get the goal. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. <laughs> he right. lost the, the Ark of the Covenant. Right. And it's gone. Right. It's in the in the warehouse somewhere. That's right. Exactly right. And and so it but it's it's the ride. And what the desire line is what provides the ride. And Hollywood blockbuster movies are thrill rides. And the question is structurally, how do you get that? Well, the first and most necessary is you've got to have that strong desire line by a single hero. Now, once you do that, another thing you see in blockbuster stories is the opposition setup. You have to have one main opponent who is present and attacking for the entire story. Now, you hear that you say, well, obviously, you know, when I, when I watch all my movies, there's always that opponent there. Well, yeah, what you're not seeing are all the scripts where the opponent, where there either isn't a main opponent or is it a main opponent who's there for a while and then, you know, he disappears for a while? And no, it's got to be one main opponent attacking the hero relentlessly. And then that's 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 the tip of the iceberg, because then you have to have a support group of opponents. 
preferably hidden under the surface. So we don't see how these opponents are connected. They are connected. They're not always, but they, in, in the most popular and typically the best stories, the opposition is connected to each other in some way, but it's a hidden hierarchy. So this is another, because what does that do? It gives you ongoing conflict. It just, these things, the conflict never stops. And it's also what allows you to build the conflict. You know, people, when they talk, these three act structure people, they say, oh, I'm having, if you notice, they always have second act problems. It wasn't first act problems. It's not third act problems. It's second act problems. Yeah, because 99% of scripts go bad in the middle because the writer using three act structure doesn't know what to do with the story. Well, what's supposed to happen is that in this conflict between the hero and the opposition over the goal, you not only get conflict, you build conflict. And unless you set up this op- this opposition in a connected way where each opponent wants to defeat the hero for a different reason and using a different technique – Then you can create what I call this Gatling gun approach to the old Gatling gun, machine gun type of thing. Mm -hmm. Instead of, instead of, okay, the the hero's taking action steps to reach the goal. Ten minutes later, um, the main opponent attacks. And then he goes another ten minutes, and then the main opponent attacks again. No. If you've got this hierarchy of opposition, main opponent attacks. Second opponent attacks, third opponent attacks, back to the main opponent, then the second opponent. Bam, 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 bam. So what you're getting is what I call the, the, the key to the middle, which is punch, counter, punch. That's the key to the middle of the story. You really, what you're trying to set up is a heavyweight fight between two equally matched opponents, and they are pounding the shit out of each other. And that's what until you get to the very end with the battle, which is the biggest conflict of all. And one of them, probably the hero is going to win. End of story. I leave the theater. I feel fantastic. I tell all my friends. And this is why the whole end game, you know, Avengers end game was such a monster hit. But what they did was they built it up over a decade of stories yeah. that built yes. up those characters. And it was just something that no, no one's ever done in Hollywood to the yeah. point where, at the end, and, and spoiler alert if you guys haven't seen this, but at the end when – I mean if you haven't, it's not my fault, guys. Um, yeah. But at the end when Iron Man finally does that that snap and, – and that's a perfect example. Like Thanos is such a amazing villain because yeah. he's an unmovable object. I mean wow. – and I love the way they set it up in Infinity, uh, Infinity War, which is the first part of that. Yeah. In the very, very beginning – they throw the Hulk at him. And we all know the Hulk is the most powerful thing we've seen. Nobody can beat the Hulk. No one can beat And he wipes the floor with the Hulk in five <laughs> minutes. And you're like, oh, this guy. And, and But that's just such wonderful writing and so yeah. beautiful. Like within that one minute, you knew this is someone not to be trifled with. If the Hulk just got his ass handed to him. And then it's just this constant beating that he did. I mean, Thanos just beats on the Avengers, beats on them and beats on them. So finally at the end, it takes everybody yeah. <laughs> to, to finally, to finally beat him. Um, I was watching a movie uh, the other day because, you know, we're in the middle of COVID. So you start re- re- recycling old movies you hadn't seen in like a decade or two. And I was watching Borat and I hadn't seen Borat in. Yeah at least 15 years. And it's still funny. It's still funny to this day. But when you were talking about desire, you know, even as a silly of a film as that is, he has this desire that holds through the entire movie is he wants to go and meet Pamela Anderson and marry her. Um, and that drives the whole story. Without that, it's just a dude mirandering around the country. It's a perfect example of no matter what you do, you have to have a clear desire endpoint, even if it's as fakey as that. <laughs> right. Right? It's something. It drives the story. But so what? You know, right. because it's it's what and, – and this, by the way, is an especially difficult problem that comedy writers have. Mm. They – again, they're dealing with certain misconceptions that are killing them. And the big misconception that comedy writers have, they think, 
It's you pack as many jokes in to the story as you can. OK, that is disaster right there, because what happens is what they don't realize is that a joke stops the forward momentum of the story because we are stopping. Everybody's stopping to watch somebody fall. Yeah. On a banana and peel. Right. Drop, right. And then we laugh at it. OK, that was great. I really enjoyed that. OK, you string too many of those together at the beginning without setting up a storyline, a desire line that you hang everything on. And all of a sudden, again, you're 10 to 15 minutes in, you hit the dead end wall because there is no forward story momentum. There's no narrative drive. The narrative drive is just as important, if not more important, in a comedy as it is in something like Avengers, which which at least has the benefit of all this big violent conflict that can that you know dazzle, to, right? To right. keep keep you dazzled. But in comedy, no, you've got to hang those jokes on a storyline, and that is provided by the clear goal that the hero is only going to get to at the very end. And it, and it's silly. And, and for everyone listening who writes comedy, I mean, even as silly of movies like Airplane and yeah. Dumb and Dumber, who uh, which are classics in comedy, Dumb and Dumber, they're trying to get the suitcase back to the girl who he's fallen in love with, you know, from a distance. That's the driving factor. Airplane. We gotta land this and survive. Gotta we gotta land the plane and survive. That's the but it's very they're they're not really grand plots here. Right. It's very simple, but the point is it's a comedy. We need something to 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 hang the jokes on. To, yeah. And give an excuse to go where we're gonna go with it. So an airplane is obvious, and but dumb and dumber, they're going across country. And and they keep all these jokes happen along the way, but it's being driven by something. Because if if there what, then there'd be no plot. It's just be two guys doing stupid stuff. It's Beavis and Butthead essentially. Right, right. Which is uh, now I wanted to also talk to you about because we didn't touch this last time, and and I wanted to hear your thoughts about it. Theme. Yeah. Theme is such an important part, and I feel it's something that a lot of screenwriters just don't even think about. It's like an afterthought about the theme of like, what are you trying to say with the story? What's the underlining, you know, you know, arc for the character or for the story? Like, what are you trying to say? Can you talk a little bit about theme and the, and, and how you, how it, you know, you, you think about it? Sure. Alex, so this is getting a little freaky because the, the, the thing that I've most been working on uh, <laughs> with, with the new book that I'm writing uh -huh. is, is theme is that is what, you know, I, I talked just before about the, the fact that the, the big problem that separates the top professionals from everybody else is the ability to plot. But we got to take that even a step farther. The real problem that even some of the, the top professionals have is that they don't know how to express the theme through the complex plot. That's where you get the double punch. Now, plot, just plot on its own is great. And that's the essence of popular storytelling. But if you've got, if you can also express a powerful theme through the plot, so it's not heavy handed, the audience does not know that they're getting this life affirming, this upraising theme in the story. And because if they think that's what they're going to get, they're going to shut down right away. But if, if you get it past their defenses, which you do with the plot, it, it's just, it, it takes what, what, however popular that story is, and it magnifies at least double and probably more. Now, let, let me give you an example. An example I, I, I love to use is, is The Dark Knight. In my opinion, mm -hmm. the greatest superhero movie ever made mm -hmm. and I, 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 w I would challenge anybody to come up with one that's better and I don't just mean that's fun I don't just mean mm -hmm. the only the only one that I can think of if you because you've thrown the challenge down John so I have yeah, to say go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Logan is probably yep. in the top five with Dark Knight I do agree with you that Dark Knight is yes it, and, and for the same reason for the same reason, because it's a superhero movie with theme. Yeah, with, with a lot theme. of themes. So, 
a lot of theme, but it's done beautifully. It's done beautifully through the through the plot of the story. Mm -hmm. But for me, the reason that Dark Knight is even greater is I think the 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 main character is more complex. Batman is a more complex character. In fact, I think he's the most complex superhero there that's ever been written. And that goes all the way back to the original comics. But it's also the ambition of the theme in The Dark Knight is greater than in Logan. In The Dark Knight, he really questions the whole concept of the superhero. Because right. the, the superhero is essentially the religion of it, – it is a religion. It, it is the superhero religion. It is the idea that superheroes can save us. Now, what the Dark Knight then does thematically is says, is that really a good idea? Isn't it better instead of putting all of our faith in some superhero or outside force – that is going to come in and save the day for us, wouldn't it be better if we all decided we're going to get in and solve the problem ourselves and working together? And what he does is he, he, he sets it up with this great character comparison of you've got the Dark Knight, you've got the White Knight, who's the prosecutor, who at least he starts off as the White Knight, and then you've got the Joker, who is at the other extreme, he is, he is darkness personified. He's anarchy, right? Right, exactly. And so, and what they, what, what the entire plot then is set up to express the theme of is it good for us to have a savior? And the way they do it is the plot is totally driven by the Joker. Mm -hmm. And the plot is quite brilliant. In fact, if anything, there's too much plot there. It, it, the, 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 the Nolans are the only people in the world that I would say, <laughs> They write too much plot. Uh, <laughs> the rest of this, that's not a problem, right? right. You can't have too much plot. But, but, but what they do is they, the plot is driven by the joke, and it's really a sequence of challenges that become more and more complex that the Joker gives to Batman to solve. And what they are, by complex, I mean morally complex. They put Batman in a more and more difficult complex um, moral position. So, for example, who are you going to save? You're going to save right. your girlfriend, or you're going to save the White Knight, the prosecutor? Until they end with the biggest moral challenge of all, where he he does the classic prisoner's dilemma um, with the two ships. You know, right? Do you blow or do you blow them up because you think they're going to blow you up? And so it's really on so many levels, it's brilliant. But my point is, it's because that the plot is in service to this larger theme that it had the kind, not just is why it's so great. It's why it's so popular. And this is what always surprises people. People think that theme is theme versus popularity. no. It's only theme versus popularity if you don't know how to express theme right. If you do, if you express theme through the dialogue by preaching and saying, okay, here's what you need to learn from our movie. <laughs> no, that's not going to work. And people are going to avoid it like crazy. But if you express that plot like The Dark Knight, where you're doing it through the characters, the character opposition, and the plot sequence, then – the audience just goes away thinking that's just the greatest thing I've ever seen. That's, that's why, you know, I mean, this, this question about theme is it, the problem with plot is people just don't know how to do it. They don't, there's right. because there's so many techniques involved theme. The problem is they don't know how important it is. Now I, I want to ask you this cause I, I'm fascinated by the movie avatar. Now, Avatar, up until recently, and still arguably with with you know with the inflation, is the biggest movie of all time. Yeah. It has a very strong, some say, overbearing theme. Um, yeah. Actually, a bunch of themes layered on top of each other. What made that film so because it's so popular? Because yes, there was 3D and there was amazing visual effects. But we've seen amazing visual effects before, and they movies have died. And it, the, what is it about that film that caught 
the attention or the the fantasy of um of the pop of, of the world at such a level that it took year, a decade <laughs> almost for a film to even and it, Avengers Endgame barely creeped over 10 years later. <laughs> You know, Disney like pushed it out one more time to get the extra two or three million it needed to just yeah. say we're the biggest movie of all time, even though, you know, it wasn't. But so how what's your what's your take on that film? Well, again, I was just, you asked me this question right at this time, um, <laughs> because I think Avatar is such an important film and and is often so misunderstood. I did an entire class on it, mm-hmm. okay. um, like, like an hour and a half class just on the techniques of Avatar and why it works. And so, you know, I'm not going to take up all of the time. <laughs> no, I'm sure, I'm sure the audience would be fascinated. Maybe we could yeah. do another episode just on Avatar. but Because yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, 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 I could do it very easily having done it already. <laughs> um, but the, the Avatar, James Cameron is, in my opinion, the best popular storyteller in film popular storytelling and to a lot of people that's kind of that's kind of faint praise that's that's you know oh yeah he's you know nobody's going to criticize him for writing a great film um or say that he wrote a great film um but those people would be quite wrong because that those talents those skills are very complicated they're very advanced and he knows exactly what he's doing, beginning with how he combines his genres. This guy is the ultimate genre movie maker. And he always combines the same three, which are myth, action, and love story. And that combination, that That's combination nice. of genres, it doesn't get more popular than that. Wow. You're, I was like, I'm, I'm going back now into his filmography and I'm going, yep, that's yeah. there. Yep, that's there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Even Terminator, from Terminator, Terminator to The Abyss, True Lies, Titanic. I mean, other than Piranha 2, but we don't count that. And, and, and it, it's, it's important to start with the genres because the genres are the story forms. And, and almost all of my work over the last 30 years has been really focused on genres. How do each of the genres work? What are the genre beats? for each form, and then how do you mix them? Because almost nothing now is a single genre. And it hasn't been for at least 20 years, probably more like 30. And what brought it on was Star Wars. Star Wars was the first really film to really mix multiple genres. And you see in the difference from from Jaws to Star Wars. I think Jaws was, it came out in 76. 75, Jaws, 75. and 76, and then and Star Wars right after. Right. You have the, 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 er, everything before Star Wars, everything after Star Wars. Jaws is a single genre story. It's a horror story, right? Star Wars is multiple genres. And f- once that came out and people saw, the studio saw how popular multiple genres were for a worldwide audience, it's been that way ever since. So, and we were talking earlier about Blockbuster, and I mentioned, first of all, Desire and then the opposition setup. Third one is mixing genres, multiple genres. And in the, the, the Rescue Worksheet, I have a place where people can tell me at least, at least two and preferably three genres that are going to make up your story. Because what you're doing with the audience is you're saying, I'm going to sell you two for the price of one. I'm going to sell you three for the price of one. And story... In story terms, what it does is whatever beats you have for one genre, now you add a second, you add a third, you're getting incredible density of story beats. And what does that translate? Plot. It's giving you great plot. It's giving you narrative drive. All these things we were talking about earlier. Because if you, so if you have a, a love story, that's a certain amount of beats that have to happen in that. If you have that's an right. action, there's a certain amount of beats that happen after that. If there's myth, there's a certain amount of beats that have action. Right. So just by the nature of combining genre, you're just automatically have to have a more complex plot purely yes. because you're not it's, just doing Romeo and Juliet. Exactly. Exactly. And the, one of the nice things about it is, is if you know the beats, because you got to know the beats, but if you know the beats, it's practically doing the job for you. 
Because if you got to hit all of those beats, of course, the trick is going to be, how am I going to combine them? How am I going to mix them? How am I going to sequence them? And that's easier said than done. But once you do, then you've got a fantastic plot from beginning to end. And you're not going to have that middle that collapses because you don't know what the main character is supposed to do. You're going to have to be doing great stuff every five minutes. You're going to have a major beat happening. So that's the first thing that, that you get in Avatar. And all of the beats for each of those genres is there. Um, you're also getting this very powerful thing. And yes, in certain ways, that is definitely overdone. It's, it's heavy handed. But there's enough in the theme that is part of the story structure that the stuff that's heavy handed, you can kind of, you know, overlook and you're still getting moved by it. Because you're still what, – what, what is the basic story? It's the basic story. It's a, it's a battle between a tech society and a nature society. And you're seeing what a tech society gone you know, without limits and what it does to nature – and it's a horrible thing to see. But if you look, but if you look at Avatar, I mean, there's probably more than <clears throat> just three. I mean, you're talking about machine ver- man, uh, man versus nature, or machine versus nature, as well. That's another kind of kind of storyline in that as well. And there's probably a few other layers in there that we can't even see yet. Well, that, but those are those are definite important lines and elements. Those are not actually, and this may just be a semantic difference. I would not. Those are not genres per se. So, so man versus machine, or nature versus uh, man. Those kind of like jo- which are types of themes. Those types are major of themes. themes. Those are themes. major themes. However, one mm-hmm. of the things I talk about in, in the Avatar class is that one uh, one of the reasons it was so popular is because it it used two what I call two new myth forms because what almost all writers in Hollywood have done for the last 50 years is when they were doing a myth-based story, they went back and borrowed from the ancient Greek myths Mm -hmm. and they just updated. And that's great stuff because those are great stories. But what, what, what Cameron did was he took two new myth forms that nobody was playing with. And he made that the basis of this story. And what are those two myth forms? One is the ecological myth. And the other is which which takes in tech versus nature. And how do you balance those out? Obviously, we don't have a balance initially, and it has to be reapplied. But the, and the other is a female myth, because what – what happens in this story on the surface, it's what a, we have a conflict between a tech culture and a nature culture. But what's really going on under the surface in story terms is you're getting male, male myth versus female myth. All that military stuff that, that comes in, all those guys, those are the Joseph Campbell male myth beats. But – What he's doing then is he's putting them into conflict with the female myth beats, which nobody else has done. Nobody else is playing with, except in the last few years, we've had a few movies that have gotten into the female myth, like Inside Out, like Gravity, and they're massive hits. And I I always always tell my, my students, you know, if you want to have a good chance of writing a hit film in the next 10 to 20 years, write a female myth. Modernize, modernize the female myth. And it's it's, you know, half the population. And yet the stories that are about their journey have not been told for 3000 years. Ever since the you know male cultures took over from female cultures. So, you know, then not to get too esoteric here, but but that's the kind of thing that's going on in Avatar that when we watch it is just really fun story in this, you know, these, this great world and, and with great special effects and so on and likable characters. But what's going on under the surface structurally is massive and very revolutionary. And it easily overcomes 
the obvious, quote, mistakes that are made like, you know, what is the desire line? They want to, they want to, they're mining for obtainium. They want to obtain, obtain you know, <laughs> I mean, it's, the, it's a bit on the nose. It's a bit yeah, on, the on the nose. nose right? <laughs> if that isn't a classic MacGuffin, I don't know what is. But, right. But the point is, who cares? It doesn't. It's such a minor mistake, if you will, that the, the, the fact that he's doing all this other stuff so well and really so far beyond anybody else working today is 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 what is what gives him those kinds of those kinds of numbers at the box office. And he did now, well, he, I don't mean to interrupt you, but he did the same thing with Titanic. Like Titanic had no reason at all right. to be a movie to anybody wanted to watch. Yeah, it's like we all know the ending. Right. We all yeah. know the story. What, one of the one of the worst calls I've ever made, Alex. One of the worst calls I ever <laughs> oh, made. You when I heard this was coming out. I said, <laughs> "Oh, what a disaster! This thing is going to this is going to be a bomb in the box office. I know what's going to happen." Two hundred million dollars? Is he insane? <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And but what did he do? What did he do? He took a dis, the, the, the disaster picture structure, right. which is a kind of action myth based story, and he added a love story. And what that meant was, see, the reason that the disaster pictures typically they, they'll have a certain audience, but they, they're, they're not that big, is because it, it's really a cross cut of various people as they're being destroyed by whatever the disaster is. Right. Right. But we haven't got to know any of them well <clears throat> enough to care. And so right. what does he do? He saves the disaster for the very end of the picture. Right. And the whole three quarters of the movie is the love story about two people who we now really, really care about. And he adds that at the end onto everybody else getting killed. And then we've got a massive Oh, you know, and massive. don't forget, and don't forget. Now you also have the anticipation of the entire audience, 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 audience knowing yeah. what is going to happen, which is a very rare yeah. thing because it's just a story that the entire world knows about. So we all like, oh my god, we love Jack and, and Rose, but, but but the ship's going to sink. Are they going to make? So that yeah. is an additional layer on top of it as well. Yeah. I mean, I I agree with you. I've been I, every time James Cameron comes out with someone, it's like I I go in James, I trust. Like I. I I might not understand it when he's doing it. Like I don't think these next like it on paper four more avatars or five more avatars that he's making are arguably ten years after the first one. Like does it, you know people are like does anyone care? It's even relevant. I'm like in James, I trust. I yeah. whatever he's doing. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. I have a lot more trust in him being able to extend the Avatar series sure. than the Star Wars people have <laughs> for extending their series. Um, fair, fair enough. And also, you know, the, just like a lot of popular filmmakers and and storytellers in general, from Spielberg to Hitchcock uh, to King, even Stephen King, they aren't given the respect that they're they're due. You know, when Spielberg was hitting, you know, home run after home run in the late seventies, early eighties. He was just like, I mean, he, there was just a run and, and King as well and Hitchcock, but they were never, oh, he's popular. Oh, it's popular. Mm-hmm. Only later in their careers do people go back and go, you know what? This guy's kind of a, kind of a genius. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's you know? the thing. We, in our, in, in, in the back of our mind, we associate popularity equals mediocre. Right, pulp, like pulp, it, like pulp. Right, it's pulp. It's neither really good. It's not really bad. You you don't you don't get that kind of popular success by it being really embarrassingly bad. Mm-hmm. No, it's just middle of the road. But in fact, there are some, and most popular stuff is middle of the road. But there are some who are able to, and I I talk about it. This is an actual technique, which is to transcend the genre. Right, and it, it's something you actually do in the script which kicks it up from what everybody else is doing in that genre. And it's, and it's, it's doing something that we really haven't seen before or we've seen it very rarely. And basically what they're doing is they're taking the traditional beats and they're twisting them and resequencing in some cases so that even though it's the same general structure, it's for example, a detective story. It's still a detective story, but 
the way they did the detective story, I've never seen before. So it's filled with surprises. And this is one, in, in my opinion, one of the keys, if not the most important, I won't say rule because I don't like that word, but, but it's pretty damn close to a rule, which is that your best chance of success as a screenwriter or in any medium of storytelling is specialize in one genre, become the best at that form, mix it with two or three other forms, and transcend it. Do it, do the beats in a unique way that we've never seen. And if you do that, you get the combination, rare combination of it's really popular and it's highly respected critically. It's like pulp, like pulp Fiction. Like Pulp Fiction. Like Pulp Fiction. Or recently, for example, I just mentioned the detective form, Knives Out. Yeah. The Who Done It? Like, when was the last time we saw Who Done It? Like, Clue? Right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it, exactly. It does not exist in the movies anymore. It does not, the, the last one we had. What, certainly. Oh no, the the Orient Express, the Orient Express uh, film yes. came out a little bit ago as That's well. A, but in terms of like an original, an original, uh, you're going back to L.A. Confidential. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, L.A. To Confidential. Again, it transcended, but in but basically, the detective form does not exist in the movies. It's all in television, all in television, and yet he was able to do it in such a unique way that we want to, you know, leave home. Leave all the, the detective possibilities we have on the TV and actually go to the theater and watch it. I mean, that was really quite original and, and ingenious, some of the things that he was doing. But that's what you want to do, whatever your form is. You need to specialize so you can master the beats. You can't twist the beats until you've mastered them in the first place. And it, by the way, it just brings up another pet peeve of mine. One of the things that drives me absolutely nuts is when I hear, you know, on these on these you know, Facebook posts or these screenwriting places, they say, you know, you you have to to uh, learn the rules to break the rules, um, and you know, the implication is that the ideal is to not have follow any, rules, right? Not have, not follow any rules because because that stunts creativity, right? Well, on on the surface, that makes total sense. It's complete nonsense because what those rules are, what I always say is, well, if it's a good rule, you probably want to follow it. If it's a bad rule, no, you don't. But for example, if I'm if I'm walking on the top of a of a mountain and there's a rule that if you step off of the mountain, you're going to fall to your death. You don't want to break that rule. Right. So, Same thing goes with story. It was a story. You know, there are certain things that, that you want to do. You want an active main character driving the story. Right. You want to have a single main character who can focus the conflict and so on. You want other opponents who can create a, a density of attack and so on and so forth. There are certain rules that are really useful, and this is the way genre works as well. Those beats are rules. Those are, those are beats that must be there or it's not the form. If you don't have a first kiss in your love story, you're dead. But is it, once you got that, then you have to do it in a unique way. But isn't, isn't it true, though, like I've seen this happen with, with directors, with, um, with screenwriters. They're so invested in showing that they do not adhere to these rules that they'll go out on a limb – to do something that's so outside the box of rules and right. it doesn't work. So it's the right. equivalent of me going up or like a, a happy Madison. If you remember that one with Adam Sandler, where he was the golfer, he played golf with a hockey stick um, because <laughs> that's the way he knew how to do it. And it worked for him. But generally speaking, if I show up to a golf, a, a golf course and I'm going to drive with a hockey stick because it's not the rule. Right. I'm not going to make it. There's certain things in a, in a golf swing, in a golf yeah. club. There's certain basics that you need to do. Now, once you're Tiger Woods and you've swung that 
if you want to bring out a hockey stick, I'm I'm going to watch Tiger Woods with a hockey stick and see how it works out. <laughs> but but he's not going to do it if he's trying to win that tournament. Right. See, that's the thing is right. these rules are there because they work. And the, the point is not to be slave to the rule. And that's why I always say learn the beats of the genre, but don't break those beats. Don't don't fail to don't say, oh, I'm beyond these beats and I don't have to have them at all. No, do the beats in a way we haven't seen before. Like Cameron. Like Cameron. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it, but 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 this thing about genres and how you deal with genres it, that's the game. That's the ball game now. In every medium in po- in worldwide storytelling. I just never I've just never again once again John you've made me think about story in a completely unique way cuz I I on a on a sub, on a visceral level I understood what you meant. Yeah. But I never consciously thought about combining genre before. But like you're like yeah, he's right. It's an action mixed with myth, mixed with a love story. And he's done it all his career. <laughs> <laughs> and he's been extremely successful, and with even uh, what is the secret agent, true lies, you know, story, which again on paper it sounds like eh, eh, it doesn't sound like oh, okay, eh, it does. But when you start looking at a movie like True Lies or The Abyss, even, I mean, it's it's a love story. At the end of the day, The Abyss is a love story that happens to have sci-fi and aliens and some cool action in it. And then there's, and then he also, don't forget, he always throws the technical, right. you know, prowess over it, which a lot of screenwriters don't have that capability because they don't have a James Cameron in there. So he's a very unique style filmmaker as a whole package. It's, it's just nobody, not Ridley Scott, not Nolan, not oh. Fincher, not Kubrick. There's just nobody that's had his combination of stuff and how he does but, it. But also keep in mind, keep in mind that it, it's so often forgotten. And I'm, I'm a huge believer in screenwriter as auteur. Mm-hmm. I, I do not believe, I think the director auteur theory is one of the stupidest things that anybody ever came up with. And every time I teach my class in Paris, I make it a point to tell them that because that's where it came from. Of course, you know, and it's spread here. But but you know, some of the directors you mentioned write their material, mm-hmm. but some of them don't. Yeah. And the thing about Cameron, which is why he's been able to get this consistency of not only quality but consistency of popularity, is that he's always a co-writer on it, mm-hmm. and 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 or or the only writer. And what that allows him to do is he's come, he's creating it from the structural position. When a director comes onto it, the stru- yeah, you can change certain things, but the structure is there. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be messing with that unless you want massive cost overruns. So that's why I always look, I always look at the screenplay, even though it's not fashionable, you know, everybody else likes to throw around their directors. But to me, it, it's the, unknown screenwriter or writer director that is really where you need to look at for a what are the techniques from why this thing is working Mm -hmm. and then and then be why are why is this person so good at where where, what is their skill level and cameron is just consistently done it over over years and years and years this entire career over decades yeah over decades of, of work now i wanted to touch upon the villain a little yeah. bit and, and and how to really write a really good villain. And I would love to use, cause we've spoke about him earlier. I, and I think there's just such, it's such a wonderful teaching tool, the Joker and Batman specifically yeah. in the dark Knight. I, I just don't think that there's been in recent history, a villain written so beautifully and it's so perfect for that hero you throw the joker in avatar not so much uh it doesn't work because he he's not designed for that world but because of the complete he's literally the mirror uh, the mirror image of batman and that's what a good villain should be correct yeah. yes well but, but, but the question is what does that mean yes and you're absolutely right but what does that mean right. and and y- yes, I agree. The Joker is one of the all-time great opponents in movie history. Certainly, it is, I would say, one of the two keys for my opinion that it is the best superhero ever made. One being the fact that the original main character 
has got so much. He's not super. He's not this Superman type of character. He right. is a human being who is deeply flawed and troubled. But before and you – If you with that, you can't do anything else. But can I, but, can I stop you for one second? Yeah. Is Batman that – Amazing of a character and superhero without a Joker. Yes, he is. Okay, but he cannot get to that level. Mm-hmm. He get he, he gets to his highest level because of the in Joker. Dark Knight with the, because of the Joker. Mm-hmm. But the original source material, the reason that any Batman movie is going to be better than any Superman movie is because the original main character is human and he is. His his flaws, his his the what I call the the first of the seven major structure steps, the weakness need. He's got so much weakness need, and so much ghost, so much stuff that is that that has been troubling him for his whole life. That any time he goes into a story, you're you're automatically in a hundred yard dash. You're at the fifty yard line. I mean, it's a tremendous advantage. But having said that, no, he cannot get to the heights of a character without the Joker because you know I talk about this in the anatomy story is the the opponent is probably the most important single element in a story because the opponent is what causes the hero t- to change. Without the attack of the opponent, the hero is not motivated to change. They're not motivated to look at the great internal flaw that starts the whole story and say, hey, this is not working for me. I'm getting my clock clean by this opponent, and the only way I'm going to beat him is if I deal with what's really the problem here. So that's number one. And I always say in the anatomy story, the hero learns through the opponent. And that's an incredibly important principle in story right there. Um, another key principle is that the hero is only as good as the, as the person he fights because, uh, and I always use the analogy of a, of a tennis match or, 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 or you know, a, a, a game, a sport, which is that each character drives the other to greatness. It's because of the conflict between them that each is forced to dig down, not just one, not just the hero. Each is forced to dig down and come up with their best stuff. And, th- and then they make that punch, and then you get the counter punch. And, and it's, it's testing each of them to their, their, their fullest capability. And so that when you get character change at the end for the hero, in really great stories, you're also going to get character change for the opponent. Now, the, you, you look at the Joker. The Joker is... Very misunderstood, in my opinion. Most, when it came out, most most critics talked about him as this nihilist. You know, he had nothing of value. Not so. Um, he he very definitely has a set a value system, but it's just a very dark value system. <laughs> and his value oh, he has a point of view. He has a definite point of view. Right, and in fact, the entire movie is a thought experiment conducted by the Joker to prove his view of humanity, Mm -hmm. which is humans are simply animals with a thin veneer of civilization. And you put them in the slightest bit of trouble, and that veneer is going to get washed away, and you're going to see what they really are, which is they're just, they're going to, they're going to eat you alive. And so that's why he gives Batman these increasing moral challenges because he's trying to prove it. And to me, the, the you know the brilliance of the prisoner's dilemma thing with the ships oh. at the end oh. is just I mean one of the all time great beats. The big problem I have with it, and the biggest problem I have with the whole movie, I didn't believe the decision. <laughs> I, 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 you was too optimistic. Me, it was too optimistic. Yeah, yeah you're telling me. That a ship full of regular people versus a ship of criminals, yeah. right. murderers, and so on, that they are not going to blow up the criminal ship before the criminal ship can blow them up? It's, it's, it's not believable. To me, it's not believable. But having said that, having said that, 
the the construction of it and the fact that the Joker drives the story mm-hmm. is is one of the the keys to the success of this thing. And, it, and it, it's a, a technique. Uh, you know, I talked before about plot is the biggest problem that writers have, and that's because there are more skills and techniques that go into plot than all the other writing skills combined. And people just don't know what they are. And in my opinion, the single most important plot technique of all is start with the opponent. Because what a plot really is, so we think of plots, this is one of the great misconceptions, this is one of the things I've been working on over the last few years in trying to come up with a way to explain plot to people that they could actually use because it's so hard to get, is that plot, we think of plot as the sequence of actions that the hero takes in going after the goal. And, and, and that is on the surface what is, what is happening. And that's why we always talk about plot is what happens next. Well, except the question is, the real question is, what causes what happens next? And what causes what happens next is the main opponent. And that's why what a plot really is, is a sequence of actions covering the entire story that the opponent comes up with to put the hero in the greatest amount of trouble. If you think of plot that way, all of a sudden, how to plot your story will, it may not just suddenly come to you fully blown, but you're about 50% there. That's how important that concept is. But so, as I never thought about this, but you're, after thinking about it, you're right that the Dark Knight, Batman is not the one driving this, the show. Oh. Batman's not doesn't have a need that needs to be fulfilled. The Joker has his thesis he needs fulfilled, and everybody yes. around him is is a- addressing the Joker's craziness. Right. So it's not. I mean, Batman does eventually change towards the end, obviously, and he makes that sacrifice and he does all the yeah. things that he does. But he's just constantly reacting to yeah. the Joker. The Joker is the spine of the movie, That's which right. is also a unique. Which is also unique because there's not many popular films. To have the villain as the as the driving factor. No, and 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 it appears on the surface to contradict what I said earlier. We always want an active hero. Well, Batman is quite active. Oh, very. It's just it's just you know, and and we are tracking his actions in trying to catch the opponent. So in that sense, we could say that the plot is the the actions Batman takes to catch the Joker, and so he's very active in that sense, but. The key to plot is that this sequence of actions that the opponent is taking are mostly under the surface. We don't see that. And the hero doesn't see it. And that's why we get reveals. That's why we get surprise. It's because what is this? What is a reveal? And, and, and plot is based on two major things, conflict and reveals. What is a reveal? A reveal is basically where the hero and the audience realize the move of the opponent. Oh, they just pulled that. I didn't know that. That's going to cause me a big problem. And now I have to deal with it. That's a reveal. So, but, so the point is that you want to start from the point of view of the opponent. How Come up with a sequence of actions they're going to use to defeat the hero and then hide most of them. And then... The, the, the sequence of the story is the hero going after his goal, discovering various things that his opponent is doing to try to keep him from getting it. If you think if you use that sequence, that process, writing process, you're a hundred times better off than if you do it the normal way, which is here's my hero. There's my goal. He's going to take action one then action two, action three, right. action four, and so on. It, that doesn't, it doesn't work. So basically, without Pepsi, there is no Coke. Without Microsoft, there is no Mac. Yes, yes. And because you know, Coke is only Coke because he ha- it had a Pepsi yeah. to fight. If it, right. if if it had an RC Cola to fight, it wouldn't have worked as well. <laughs> no. 
not going to work. Not a great story. Not a good story. You need, you know, you needed the, um, what is it? Who, you needed yeah. Vanderbilt to go against um, Rockefeller. You needed, you, you needed those, you need the giant industries, you know, the, those, yeah. those two, and they're, at the end of the day, it's two characters that have to battle it out. That's right. Good versus bad. And, and has, but, and, and it, that's why I always tell, I always tell writers, never think of your hero and opponent as two separate characters. Yes, they are separate. Two sides. But in fact, it is the relationship between them is the most important relationship in the entire story. And that's what you constantly want to be aware of is the relationship between the two of them and how it goes back and forth as each one gets the upper hand. So then, so, okay, so Batman begins, if we're going to, if we could, we could, because I'm a huge Nolan fan. um, And I do agree with you. Sometimes he has too much plot Uh, (laughs) because sometimes you're just like, at that hurt i can't i yeah. can just blow something up chris i can't think that hard right now <laughs> i mean inception you're just like what's going i don't know what's going on but this is a fun ride <laughs> yeah. but so batman begins um you know he basically re- revamped the entire batman myth and he did it in a beautiful way and a lot when i saw batman begins i was like well this is the best superhero movie ever made then the dark knight showed up and it was like oh my god this is just at a completely different level yeah. then batman uh, dark knight rises shows up yeah. and arguably the weakest of the three but yet i'll put it up against almost a lot of other superheroes right. so what made that film not work nearly as well as the dark knight um, one of the great questions, one of the all time great <laughs> questions. I, Cause it's I, good. I, it's good. I, oh, it's really good. It's, it's good. really good, but it's not as good as the other two. And it's not, it's not as good as he wanted it to be. Um, I, because it was, uh, I was, I'm such a fan of his and such a fan of the, the, you know, the, the two movies that came before it. Um, I did a breakdown of that film it's so on my website, truby.com, mm. and where I talked about how could this go wrong. And in my opinion, first of all, it's because it is too ambitious. It's He tried – he basically – he went into it saying, okay, I've just done The Dark Knight. He made The Godfather. <laughs> he was trying to make The Godfather too. He was – Right? Yeah. I've just, done, I've just done on that level. Sure. How do I top that? And in my opinion, in trying to top it, it was so ambitious. Um, it, 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 it's basically a, 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 an analysis of a revolution in a society. How do you, you know, in, in, in The Dark Knight, you have the problem of a savior, but the society is still pretty much where it's at. You know, Batman takes the hit. So that they won't rely too much on a savior Mm -hmm. and he'll he'll be the bad guy um, so that we don't get into this superhero cult. okay? but it's still basically the same society. Well, in The Dark Knight Rises, he's trying to say, okay, how do we actually create a greater society? This is the classic question of science fiction, but he's trying to do it in the crime fantasy combination of genres. Super hard to do. But if you look at it, there's a number of beats from the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and what, what, in the breakdown way of what I talk about is it, I always take it down to the, the, the basic structure. I mentioned in the beginning, you get those seven steps, it's really hard to screw it up. And in my opinion, he put so much superstructure – in terms of the ambitions of what he was trying to tell in that story, on a desire line, I could not handle it. And I think I talk about it in the breakdown. It's a bridge too far. He just and was a little too ambitious, slightly. But he still, la- but he still landed in, in places that most filmmakers and screenwriters would kill to do. Yeah. yeah. But the problem is, without an urgent desire line tracking the entire story, Right. Because you have a large chunk where, as I recall, I haven't seen it's it since it came out. It just, it just it basically, there, it, it, exactly. There's it no desire line. It sits there. There's no urgency at all. And when you don't have the, the spine at the base, 
the whole superstructure collapses and is just it's spinning its wheels. Whereas, you know, what they sometimes do is it's plot for plot sake. And and that's where that big theme, that ambitious theme without the process, <clears throat> excuse me, without the the plot and the, the structure underneath it to drive it. Then it becomes over the top. It becomes a little on the nose and you don't get any story ur- urgency. You don't get any narrative drive. And so it gets really tiring. Yeah. And, and I, if I remember the movie correctly, there was the moment when basically when Batman's thrown into the, into the pit with a broken back after he battled Bane, yeah. it, the story just sits there for about 20 to 25 minutes. Everyone's kind of walking around Gotham. He's yep. taken over. It's a yep. few weeks. The cops are trapped underneath the thing. <laughs> like it, it's, there's nothing. Ticka, 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 right. There's, there is no drive. And then it picks up again, but there That's is exactly the point. It's one of the, because I, I couldn't remember that, but yeah. now, who broke, broke his pit. back. He's in the pit. He's in the pit. He's not doing anything. The movie is not doing anything. Right. And, and, and Bane isn't a bad villain. He's actually a, a very well written and good and obviously well performed villain. But, um, and he has a very specific, they, and that's the one thing that all the villains actually had, even from Batman Begins, yep. they all had very specific, um, points of view. And yep. Bane, Bane had a similar idea that the Joker wanted, but it just his, like, he believes that this is going to happen and this is my thesis and I'm going to prove to you, right. Batman, that this is my thesis. Yeah. You know, um, well, now well, I, I, no ones are really good at, at opponents. They're, they're really good at that. Um, because they know that's the trick to doing, driving the plot that they want to drive. Um, but, but also just in terms of character sense, um, one of the things I always push is, um, in fact, I, I make the case that even using the term villain, is a problem for a lot of writers because when we think of villain, we think of this very simplistic evil character. Yeah, twisting the mustache, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's so important. I always try to push writers, make the main opponent as complex a character as you will, because that is going to give you benefits up and down the line in not in just in terms of, of character, in terms of the emotion that the audience has for the story, and especially in terms of the plot, it's just it's just super important. Yeah, I mean, and if you look at someone like, um, you know, one of my favorite films of all time, I've spoken about many times in the show, uh, Shawshank. I mean, the villain of the the warden, and the and the and the, he had like three major villains: the the prisoner, um, the the main the main um, guard. And the and the warden is the ultimate villain. I mean, I think that's why it's so satisfying when Andy yeah. finally breaks free, and then and then just screws everybody along the way. It was such a <laughs> brilliantly written yeah. story. I can't mean yeah, it. it. Really, is terrific. Really it, it, love that movie. Love that movie. Yeah, it is. It is. It's probably one of the most perfect scripts uh, I've ever read, and one of the most perfect films I've ever seen. But I also I would argue going back to Batman. That Batman Begins could be the Godfather, where Dark Knight's Godfather too. I could argue that. <laughs> yeah, you see, I, but, but, but where I would disagree with you is on the Godfather ranking. Uh-huh. I'm, 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 I strongly like- feel that you know that you, you look at these charts. Of yeah, yeah, who's the best? Trilogies, right? you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's got Godfather <laughs> near the top. Godfather two a little higher and then Godfather three is way down. Here. I just saw that chart fly through Facebook. Right. There was like all the trilogies and yep. and yep. Fair, but to be fair, well, my the most contention mo- is my contention is Godfather two is not the movie that Godfather one is. Why? Because every beat in Godfather two was first done in Godfather one. Right. Without it, yes. it's the foundation. It's the foundation, but but right. I mean, literally every single story beat throughout the plot is in Godfather one. The difference is that in Godfather 2, they get that cross-cut structure. Oh, and so yeah. you're comparing the gangsters. You're comparing the gangsters at the different generations. But but in terms of the, you know, my anatomy story, they do an extensive breakdown of the Godfather. Right. And right. it's just one of the most beautifully written. Yes, it's great direction and so on. But I, I look at it from the point of view of storytelling, of writing a screenplay. Mm-hmm. Coppola's and a master. It is yeah. at every level, from structure through dialogue, every level, never been done better. And in my opinion, 
Um, and I also tend to give a little bit more credit just as when, you know, like when they're assigning credit in a screenplay, the original writer to me is always gets, gets most of the credit because the work of creating all of those beats is much harder than it is to adjust them later. And polish, right. And polish. And so to me, even though the polish job on Godfather 2 was incredible, that the, all of the beats are writing Godfather 1. And, you know, it's interesting. I talk about it in the class that the Godfather 2 was affected. How he wrote Godfather 2 was affected by the response that Godfather 1 got. Because it didn't get the response he thought it would get. Yeah, he thought it was going to be fired every other day. <laughs> oh, that was before he even started, yes, and thought he was shooting it. Yeah. But, I, but I mean in terms of the audience response to the ending of the story. Yeah. He, he, what he thought structurally that, that he and Mario Puzo had done is create a character who, even though he's become the new godfather, that morally he has become the devil. And the whole thing is structured to – the connection with making the equation of Michael equals or Godfather equals devil. And, and so he wanted to get something is very difficult to pull off for a writer in any medium, which is a split ending for the character. Whereas on one level, they have succeeded, succeeded tremendously on the other level, internally they have fallen and failed. And, all he got was people saying he succeeded. Isn't it great that he blew away the, the five heads of the families mm -hmm. and, along with his brother-in-law and so on? Isn't that great? They didn't see the moral decline. And that heavily affected how he then wrote Godfather 2 to make Michael a much darker character and much more – not somebody we're going to root for so much as somebody that we see that this is a guy who is becoming more and more corrupt. So, so basically, without Star Wars, there is no Empire Strikes Back, as far yes. as it being that good. And without Batman Begins, arguably, there's no Dark Knight. Yep. You yep. need the first. Yeah. In order to build build upon, you can't come out the gate with Empire Strikes Back. It doesn't have the gravitas. Huh. Well, it's the same thing if you want to go back to Endgame. You can't have Avengers Endgame without the ten years of films. That's right. That built up That's those right. characters to get and to that crescendo. There, in terms of. To get a concluding film like that in a series, mm -hmm. it's all based on what you did before. Yeah. All the setup. The setup work that they do in Marvel movies oh. is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. What's and that's why the, you know, because they you you've got this bank of characters, and they're great characters, they're great superhero characters, but it's Obviously, it's going to be in how you have them interact. And, and really, there's, it's quite an interesting story challenge that they have at Marvel, which is what do you do with superheroes? Because for the most part, they can't die. And, and we know there are exceptions to that, which I won't mention. But, mm -hmm. but the point is, if they're superheroes and they don't have any real physical jeopardy, you know, I'll always laugh at the fights in superhero movies because, you know, the, one guy hits the other guy with a punch that knocks him through three buildings – but, you know, he shakes his head like a cartoon and then gets up and goes back to the fight. It's like, you know, very quickly you realize, hey, there's nothing that's going to happen in this fight. Nobody's that's why Superman That's why Superman's so difficult to get behind. Exactly. Exactly. But but so the trick, the way Marvel handles it is how they they interweave and interconnect all the films of the separate ones so that when they get them all together – in the you know the Avengers, right? The Avengers and all of the all you know the the, the two the, the two sides the the villain team versus our right. hero team, where you're basically just t taking the heavyweight fight and you're kicking it up another ten notches uh, because you're getting one all star team against another all star team. It's all been set up, you know, years and years before with the other films. And that's where the payoff is so great. And so that's like that's what sports are. Like it's the Yankees yeah. versus the Yankees were always the great villains. If you don't live in New York, if you're in New York, they're the heroes. But the Yankees in the in the fifties and the forties and the fifties, they were they they were just dominating. And the Bulls were that in the nineties. And 
and LeBron James is that now <laughs> and and so on. So uh, it, there's oh there is that, but it takes time to build that. Um, but yeah. I have to I have to ask you this because I, you know I'm sure my audience wants to know since we've since we've been bringing it up. I've talked about this at nauseum, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. We understand now why Marvel works. Can you discuss and dissect why DC doesn't? <laughs> And why they've had so much trouble in the DC universe, which arguably has some of the greatest superheroes of all time. The, easily the most well-known. S- Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman are much more well-known than anybody other than maybe Spider-Man in the Marvel Universe prior to launching of the Marvel MCU back in the day. So why is it so difficult? What what happened at DC that it's taken them. It's still like they have some one-offs here and there that are good, but they've not been able to create what Marvel has. No. And that's, it's a big subject. And I, and I can't say that I'm an expert on it because I am not a fan for the most part of, of DC. the DC universe. Um, that says volumes right there. <laughs> right there. Um, right. But, but then again, you know, I don't, because of that basic superhero problem in superhero storytelling, I'm not as big a fan of the Marvel universe as some people are. Mm-hmm. Although I, I, I totally agree with you about, um, the, about the final film, the final Avengers film and the one just before. Um, but in terms of there's certain one-off DC films, D- DC comic films that are really good. Wonder Woman, I thought was wonderful. excellent. It was wonderful. Um, and the Batman films, obviously in the hands of the Nolan brothers yeah. are yeah. the best you get. But the problem that the problem comes in, how do you combine them into like the Justice League? Um, it's, it's the same thing. You, you're, you're basically it's for storytellers. It's the problem. How do you tell a story about an all star team? And there's lots of problems with all star teams, because among them, first of all, if you're going to have an all star team, you got to have all star opposition team. Right. And that means you've got to establish all those characters. And you got to do that all that work in previous films, so that it's not just a, you know uh, five guys with different costumes on that supposedly each has a different major superpower, and then we're supposed to that's going to be really good conflict and drama. No, that's not going to do it. That's not what it's about. But if you notice, to what a, what to me is the real key to what Marvel has done, besides what we're talking about, is setting up this stuff in previous films, which was they, I believe it was, wasn't it J.J. Abrams they brought in? um, One of those, when when they started to, they started to put the, uh, the Marvel characters in conflict with each other. Uh, I think Joss Whedon. uh, Yeah, that's right. That's right. I knew it was a TV guy. It was Mm -hmm. a TV guy. And that, that, that to me is the key right there. Because what they did is they brought in, they brought in the knowledge of television, and and television. I don't know if we talked about this the last time. Television is so far advanced from uh, above film mm-hmm. right now, it, and has been for twenty years as a medium. And there, there's various reasons for it that that we don't have time to go into. But one of the things that they do that, that is based on is because they're doing an ongoing series. They know that the the real juice of the story. Where you sustain the story is you don't bring in a new opponent every week the way you do in a police show or a detective show, a character that we don't even get to know. No, you put the main characters of the show in opposition. That's where the conflict's got to come because those are the characters we care about. Those are the characters we meet and know every week. So what they did was they figured out a way, even though these are superheroes, figured out a way to put them, to have them fight amongst themselves. And all of a sudden, you get the, the, the fact that we care about these characters, we know these characters as human beings, not just superheroes, but also we're getting the conflict-driven and building based on characters, the characters we love. Then, typically at the end, they bring in the opposing team that gives us the big battle, that gives us all the fireworks and so on and so forth, and we cop, cap off the story. But what was the trick to the whole story was all the conflict between the heroes that led up to it. And, and to me, that's what they're really good at. And also I think the biggest thing, and I've said this a lot before too, is that 
that the Marvel universe of characters, they're all kind of based, for lack of a better word, they all have vulnerabilities. Generally speaking, there's, they all have vulnerabilities. They all can get hurt. Yep. Um, even Iron Man, even, um, even Thor, who's a, he's the only God in the Marvel universe where in the DC universe, they're essentially all gods. Right. You've got as other than Batman, who honestly is a Marvel, he's a Marvel character who got, he's in the DC universe yeah. Yeah. Um, because he's much more Marvel than anything else. But you got Superman, yeah. you got Wonder Woman, you got Green Lantern, you got the Flash. These are gods. Aquaman, they're right. all gods. And when you, and that's the problem when you write for yeah. gods, if you can't kill them yeah. <laughs> or can't that, really that put the fundamental problem. Right there. That's why if, Superman movies are so yeah. difficult. Right. And, and you know, I, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the, the seven major structures. Set. First step is weakness need. If, if that's a god, they don't have a weakness need. If they don't have a vulnerability, you don't have a story. Because the whole story is designed to solve that weakness to, or to test that weakness. And so and, – and yeah, and that, that's why when, when I heard that, that they're going to have Batman versus Superman. Uh, that this it's is ridiculous. the stupidest it's ridiculous. idea you could possibly do. But notice they're trying to do what Marvel's doing. They're trying to create conflict among <laughs> the superheroes. But one is a god, one is a superhuman, the other is a human being. It's not even a contest. It would right, take right. about five seconds. Not even. It's like that's <laughs> the, my wife, who is not a superhero fan, when she heard like Batman versus Superman, that's ridiculous. Superman would kill him in five seconds. <laughs> Literally, that's what she's not a fan. I'm like, yeah, that's why it's not going to work. And I guarantee you, every person in America, when they heard that movie was coming out, the very first thought they had was that's going to take five seconds. And it took them how long? It took them like two hours to get to the fight, and the fight lasted eight minutes. Right. right. And it was just so unsatisfying as a general – like, totally absurd. It was totally absurd. It was, it was complete, completely absurd. But going back to gods really quickly though, um, the Greeks, you know, they figured out the god thing pretty yeah. well. I mean if you go back to Zeus and Hades and all these – but what they did is they added human elements to all yeah. of these gods. You know, Zeus was – they were all flawed Right. Characters, right? And well, now, I mean, you know, a, a really important thing to keep in mind is that that in Greek mythology, those gods are not gods versus humans. Gods right. are simply human beings taken to an nth degree, right? And they're done that to show how humans really are. Right, exactly, and that's definitely not what Superman is. <laughs> so, John, I'm going to ask you a few questions that I ask all of my guests. What are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? <laughs> Man, see what 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 I tend to do because it's so important that people know the genre that they're writing. Okay, that whenever somebody will, what are the screenplays you think are great that you recommend? I always first say, well, what what genre are you talking about? <clears throat> but but given that there are 12, 13, 14 major genres that almost all stories are built on. Mm -hmm. um, I can give you some examples. For example, example Gangster, uh, The Godfather, mm -hmm. um, Godfather One, and um, Goodfellas. Mm -hmm. uh, I put them. I put them pretty much on the same level. Both brilliant scripts. Brilliant scripts. Um, if you talk about crime. Uh, you're talking about usual suspects. The best, I'd say, to come out of Hollywood in the last 25 years. Oh, at no, least. no. It, that was a 90s film, so we're talking about 30 years plus now, something like that. <laughs> um, and also, uh, if you want to talk about, I mean, this, this this film just blows me away, and the writing on it is so great. It's also, I think, in the crime. In fact, I call it a transcendent crime story, which is in Bruges. Oh yeah, in, in Bruges, yeah. Just, great just film. absolutely brilliant. Um, if you're talking about, uh, you know, fantasy crime, uh, you know, or the myth form, you're talking about uh, the Dark Knight. Uh, absolutely, you got to read that script. Um, if you're talking about the action form, I'm going back to a, I've got to go back 60 years and to a different country. 
Mm -hmm. the movie that every action movie is based on. It's The Seven Samurai. Probably Mm -hmm. the greatest script ever written, in my opinion. Greatest script ever written. Um, If you're talking about a love story, probably When Harry Met Sally. Uh, Romantic comedy, it it doesn't get better than that. That and and interesting. Annie Hall. Annie Hall. Annie Hall, Hall, absolutely, at that level as well. Um, and going back many years, I'd say probably 80 years, to one that is, is I, I often like to compare to Harry Met Sally. It happened. Is, it, it's actually a Philadelphia story. Oh, that's another one. I was going to say it happened one night, but um, yeah, Philadelphia also, story. Also great. Um, yeah. So I'm just trying to think of some of the other genres. Detective story, uh, I go with um, uh, L.A. Confidential. Mm-hmm. Absolutely brilliant script, um, as good as that form gets on film. Uh, now, of course, if you want to talk about just great writing, then you got to go. You got to go to television. Uh, the, the, the best writing in the world is done on television. Has been for twenty years. Then I'm looking at shows like Breaking Bad, um, Mad Wire. Men, The Wire, The Wire. Uh, the, my top five five greatest shows ever are those: The Wire, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, um, Sopranos, and uh, the original Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. And the writing, the writing, a different medium, but especially if you're interested in understanding how plot works and how to extend plot, uh, you got to watch television. You got to look at the, how they extend extend plot over multiple episodes to create an entire season. We um, should, we should have you back just to talk about television. One episode, yeah, like that's yeah. all we, cause I know that we didn't even touch television in this episode. Yeah. Um, and I know that's something you're pretty passionate about. Yeah. It's, it's over the last almost 10 years now, the one class that I'm asked to do most often around the world is television, how to write for television, because, uh, it, it, that's that's where the quality is, and a, any country in the world can write at that level because it's all in the writing, and the writers are the auteurs in television, not the director. Very and you said, when, you, when you put the writers in charge, that's what you get. <laughs> touche, sir. Touche. Yep. Now, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Uh, you got to learn your craft. Uh, you've got to learn the craft, and you've got to especially learn how to plot. It's, it's as they say, it is it is the skill. It is hard to come by because there's very little written on it. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons that, that almost all the classes that I've been doing in the last few years are focused on that. Um, but but it, it, without that ability to tell a story that is – is going to please the audience, not just be fulfilling to the audience, but please the audience. Um, you're not in the game. And, and it is especially given all of the obstacles to screenwriters, you know, much greater obstacles to screenwriters than, for example, indie novels, where a lot of writers are going now because they got a hundred percent chance of getting their work out. hundred percent chance. Right. Right. Screenwriters, you have a point zero 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 one chance. So that's massive obstacle. The only way you get over that obstacle is you've got to have a plot in a in a in a genre or multiple genres that is so good, so unique, and so surprising that the reader, who is the gatekeeper and who is who is mentally that's the word I want. He's mentally programmed to say no. These people's job is to say no. The only way you can get it past them is to come up with that kind of a story with fabulous plot and incredible narrative drive. And then even a reader will not stop you. And now you also said you had a gift for the tribe today. What What is that gift you are giving us, sir? Well, I've, I've put together a worksheet that – I think will immediately increase the quality of the writer's story a lot just by going through the seven techniques that I've listed there. And I've got a place on the worksheet for them to fill in their own story. And so it's the 
Uh, I call it the Story Rescue Worksheet, and they can get it by going to www.truly forward slash indie, I-N-D-I-E. Okay. That would be truby.com forward slash indie. Truby.com. That's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I'll put that in the show notes, uh, John. Good, so, John. And I appreciate that. John, we can keep talking for at least another two hours about story. Sure. Uh, and uh, it's it's it, we have to have you on more often because it's always – a masterclass when you're on. So John, thank you so much for being on the show and dropping knowledge bombs on the tribe today, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. You're great to talk to and uh, I'd love to do it anytime. As promised, that was an epic conversation. Thank you so, so much, John, for dropping insanely big knowledge bombs on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Tribe today. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, please head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 087. And if you want access to that limited time free webinar that John Truby has put together for us called Stories That Sell, please head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash T-R-U-B-Y. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 